Uh, as Jill had mentioned, we really want to be cognizant of the time and focus on two main things. That's why we're here. So we are going to give you a little bit of information about Penske and about some of the career opportunities that may be available for you um, because probably now is the time that you're starting to think of those things. Probably more specifically if you're in your junior senior years, but also um, earlier on it's, it's definitely a smart thing to do. But then we are going to transition over into something that I would have really appreciated um, when I was getting ready for uh, job interviews, and that's interviewing do's and don'ts. And we're going to cover basics, because I think that's what it's really about. There isn't anything too complex. These are simple, simple things that can help you prepare for something that typically gives you a whole lot of anxiety. So we're going to, to clear that subject and hopefully um, answer a lot of the questions that you have, but we will certainly give you time at the end just to ask any other questions that you have. So, um, Julia mentioned my name is Karen Troxell and I'm Human Resource Manager for Penske. I support our Mid-Atlantic area and that spans from um, our Reading, Pennsylvania area, Harrisburg area, the northern tier of Pennsylvania um, up in, in, in these uh, parts and then also down south into some of our metro markets of Baltimore and DC. And I've been with the company for just about 10 years now. Been in human resources for, uh, resources for about 15. And um, prior to Penske, I worked in county government. I worked in retail. Now that I'm with Penske, I can tell you this is probably going to be my home um, as long as they'll have me uh, from now until retirement. And that's not something I could have ever said before. And not something that a lot of people have the ability to say. So that does speak volumes um, for the company. Um, but uh, hopefully with the experience that I've had in recruiting, I can also kind of insert some of my own horror stories uh, from the interviewer chair about things that I saw that you definitely want to stay away from. So hopefully I can add some value there. Huh? Well, hello, my name is Kyle Brand. Um, I am the area rental manager for the Mid-Atlantic, covering the same territory that Karen does. The, the reason why I'm here today is because the positions that our company typically hires for, which is our entry-level positions, fall within our rental department. Uh, so I myself have been with the organization for 10 years. I started with Penske directly out of college, uh, went to college in Indiana, and have moved around quite a bit with the company. So if I don't sound like I'm from around here, there's a reason for that. Um, we kind of basically just want to give you guys an idea of what we do, like, like Karen said, some, some information about our organization. Uh, I can tell you that with the information that Karen is going to share with us regarding interviews and, and different aspects of the things that you are good to do and the things that are good not to do, we've both sat in on hundreds and hundreds of interviews. So we've been able to experience some really, really good interviews and some interviews that you really want to just help the person while you're in the middle of the interview and help them realize what they could be doing differently in order to be able to, to hone their skill and be able to get the, drop, the dream job that they're looking for. So, Basically, our, our slide here, are you driven to do good work? Pinsky's a place for you. Our organization as a whole is, is an organization that's nationwide. Um, if you, if you, uh, yeah, I apologize, this is for the, for the camcorder, so if I talk with my hands and it's distracting, I, I apologize. Um, basically, this gentleman right here is the CEO of our organization. His name is Roger Pinsky. Now, if I were to ask anyone in this room what you think of, if you've ever heard of Pinsky, has anybody here ever heard of our organization? It's not abnormal, it's okay. <laughs> You're not going to hurt my feelings. I didn't know much about our organization before I started this place either. Um, but what I can tell you is the organization is so much more than what you see on the outside looking in. Um, basically, what Roger Pinsky did was he started our organization with three locations in the Pennsylvania area. Um, it was actually Reading, Pennsylvania, where he originated the, the company. And since then, since 1969, he's grown our organization into a multi-billion dollar organization. Now, what we do on the outside looking in is we rent trucks. So you're moving trucks that you see going up and down the road, uh, semis, tractor trailers, those types of things. We, we keep those trucks moving. They are high dollar assets, and if they're sitting on our lots, they're not doing us any good. That's what the quote unquote vehicle for our organization is. But for, for what we actually do as an organization, we take, take young, uh, young associates that are driven to have a solid career once become 
really good in sales, wants to become really good in management, and we take and we grow those associates. We help you develop your career path. We're right there walking side by side. So there's a lot of things that our organization does from the, the stages right after college, moving into your professional career, where we're an organization that you know, we, we, take, we take associates and we give them a chance and we, and we want to grow with them. We're always looking for the next future leaders of our organization. So, the Penske profile, we have over 200,000 vehicles, and again, you can see here one of our semis that you've potentially seen going up and down the highway. Uh, we have over 20,000 associates. North America is all I'm really going to that we're going to touch on today. We have over uh, 700 rental facilities and we have over 300 logistics facilities. So there are some logistics majors in here, correct? Supply chain management? Is that, is that correct? Okay. Okay, so we will touch on that briefly. That is somewhat of a um, sister company to our organization. We have some information in here, and if you have any further uh, questions or anything as we go through, we'd be more than happy to touch on that as well. So, all of these locations in, is that yellow, right? Sorry, I'm colorblind. Uh, all the yellow dots that you see on this map uh, are locations where we have Penske facilities throughout the U.S., so it gives you an idea of, of where we're located. And to give you just a quick overview of our Penske Corporation as a whole, we are part of the transportation arm of our organization. We also have a, the, the truck light and the DAVCO. We get into different aspects of, of trucking with, uh, with headlights and with engines. We have our automotive group, which is car dealerships. We don't have them as uh, we don't have as many automobile dealerships on the East Coast as we do as you span out throughout the West Coast of the company. Uh, performance. This is typically some place that anybody who has heard of our name is familiar with. We have cars in both the uh, the IRL league and the NASCAR. And then we also have the private equity, which is uh, our investment group that helps with trying to figure out uh, how we can help other companies with manufacturing and things like that. Bonus points for anybody who knows who our racing drivers are. Anybody? Damn, there's always one in the group that usually knows. Either, either league? All right, who are they? For, well, for NASCAR, we, we, we have the car typically in the uh, in the nationwide series, but when it does run in the what's that? Sam no, Sam Horn is yeah for for the NASCAR. That's that's the one that he runs in the IRL. We actually have um, Ryan Briscoe every once in a while, but mainly it's Elio Castroneves that's been running that car. You've probably heard of him with Dancing with, with Dancing with the Stars. Back and maybe that's where most people know him. Dancing with the Stars fans. No. I think maybe that one's already. Kind of came and gone. These yeah. Are lives, <laughs> 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 Moving on. <laughs> All right, I'll take this one. Um, what you see here is uh, in the colorful slide is how we break down our company culture. Company culture, just so you know, when you are looking at the place that you want to work, it's something you should pay attention to, and something that companies may do. A, some companies may do a better job at communicating. Um, this was something we did a lot of work on in the last couple of years, and I'm going to break it down for you again, um, because we thought that simple was best. What are we really, and how would our customers define us, right? And it's really under these three buckets um, that we would tell our story. Passionately personal all has to do with people, people that we employ, um, and the customers that we do business with. They're important to us, we get to know them. Um, even uh, as far as on a personal basis, and it's the main reason why companies continue and our customers continue to come to us. We're not the lowest priced option out there. We don't profess to be, but we're very involved with the people and we get to know them and their business. Dedicated to excellence all has to do with the quality of our product, okay? Um, we're very efficient. We get to know companies um, better than they know themselves so that we can make recommendations to them about how to be more efficient and successful in their organization. And then values, fresh thinking, this is something that sparks a lot of conversation in the organization because it has to do with always thinking um, further than where we are today. And that's something that's a very difficult concept for a lot of people in any organization because Kyle just talked about the history that we went through and how we grew from three locations to 
um, you know, thousands of locations. We have 20,000. We're a global entity, multi-billion dollars. So some people would argue, why are we changing here? We've been pretty successful. Well, Values Fresh Thinking really talks about, hey, listen, we're only as good as we know we can be, but if we really want to tap into and continue to be effective with our customers, we have to change with them. So we ask this of all our associates. This is our culture. You come to work for us and we say, we want you to walk out all of these types of behaviors, okay? So this slide is a little busy, but I kind of breezed through earlier what we do in our entry-level positions, and this kind of gives you a idea for a from our organizational standpoint, all of our associates that come directly out of college, we hire in as a management trainee on the far left there. That is our frontline position that you learn the visit, you learn the company, you learn everything about our industry from the ground up. So anything and everything that you would need to know, you get that education right there on the spot. You're surrounded by other associates at the location that are there to be able to help you and grow you. And you're also able to start really honing in on your customer service skills and your ability to build relationships with customers because you're going to be dealing with the, you know, the, the, the general public day in and day out type of thing. From there, you have options. And we're just going to focus on the top two, sales and operations. We really kind of simplify our organization into two buckets. You can either go the sales route or the operations route. Now, at no point in time, do you have to pick one route and stick with that? You can, you can go from one to the other. But it's important that you realize, from a sales perspective, the reason why we take the time as a management trainee to teach you is because when you go to the sales perspective, you're not doing outside sales. You're out on the streets working with customers where you don't have your support network like you would have back at the facility. So it's important that you learn and understand the job from the beginning so that when you are out in front of customers, you can speak from an educated standpoint and you feel comfortable. If you go the operations route, that's going to be more of you, you, have a, you have a desire for leadership, you have a desire to make sure that operations are ran smoothly. Both, are, both offer you know, great growth as, a, as an associate because you start learning more about yourself, you start pushing yourself. You may realize if you were to go one route, if you were to go into operations, you may realize I don't necessarily like managing other people, I would rather be responsible for myself and, and have a sales quota. And at that point in time, we work to try and get you going down the career path that's best for you. But again, the idea behind our organization is we're always looking out for any type of new associates that are coming right out of college that are highly interested in a fast-paced job. What we do is, is extremely fast-paced. The phones ring nonstop. You're always having customers in front of you. There's always something going on at our, at our, at our locations. So either way, they both prepare you for, for when you take the next step within our organization. One other thing to mention too, and I get this question a lot, what are the majors that we look for? In an MT role, the management trainee role, I mean, we have people who are in English majors, history majors, biology, um, because they get to, they start working for us maybe as like an internship or a summer job. They like the environment, they like the pace, because that's a moving and a shaking kind of position. And we set it up that way. That is one full goal of the organization in a very quick amount of time. I would say those MTs, those management trainees, get to know our business more than some of the, the, well, probably almost definitely more than the corporate folks who come in, and, and it turns a lot of the leadership too, because there's the most amount of touch points with the two most important things, the customer and our product, right? And that's a fast track. We've had MTs that we bring in, and in less than a year, they're on that path. And with that path, typically the next position comes with company car, comes with bonus, higher salary. So they're off and running because they gained all that experience very quickly in that MT role. One thing that's unique about an organization that you're not going to find in every organization is a lot of our senior leadership started on the counter as a management trainee. We truly have the type of philosophy within our organization that you promote from within and that you, you help make sure that they have a, a good base understanding of what they're doing in that position before we promote, promote you to the next position because we want to make sure you're set up for success. So our organization has people at the very, at the very top that have started at the, the entry level position with us. All right, supply chain leadership, um, for those of you who are in that role, 
The management trainee that we just talked about for the truck leasing side, this is what this looks like for supply chain, our logistics side of the business. Um, it is a very vigorous rotational type of program set up where we basically take care of the first 18 to 24 months of your employment, meaning we set it up for you. There's various rotations that you go through because logistics is very complicated and probably for those of you who are majoring, majoring in it, you know what I mean. There's so many different facets of the supply chain field. Um, we have locations in all different product lines. We are dedicated contract carriers for our customers. We are lead logistics providers for some of our customers. We operate out of warehouses. So we have people in leadership roles that are managing that business. This supply chain leadership program takes you through rotations and all of those different product lines so that you have the ability to flex through any number of locations in a leadership type of role. Again, this is the fast track for the supply chain group, for our logistics company. And this is a lot of work that I'm not going to go over, but I just kind of summed it up. All right. Um, screenshot of our website. And uh, the gopensky.com backslash careers, I won't go on it, but that's what the, the screen looks like. And I do have business cards that I'll um, hand out at the end or I'll put over on the table if you want to get them. Um, but understanding or, or finding out any more information about the company and about career options, if you go to that career site um, up at the top of the home page, you can actually scroll through and look at testimonials, look at other career um, paths, and so on and so forth. Okay. Questions about the organization before I go through the uh, interviewing piece. Okay. Are you having? Uh, I've, I've been reading that companies are having difficulty in hiring truck drivers. Are you experiencing that? Um, when I started with Penske, uh, it was back in 2003. I was hired as a driver recruiter. Um, so I had a lot of personal experience with that, where I was actually sitting at the truck stop on the side of the road trying to get people as they came in. So, and I learned my lingo. Um, but yeah, that was definitely a struggle um, because, again, you have, now it's, one change that I have seen is we had a lot of difficulty back then, 2003, 2004, because owner operators was like the biggest thing. Every truck driver wanted to be their own boss. They bought their truck, they hit the road, and they were carrying for other companies. There was a lot of benefit to that. Once we saw a spike in fuel and then the economy started to drop a little bit, you saw people that weren't able to afford being an owner operator anymore, so that opened them up into the job market a little bit. Um, but it, it's always a struggle because, you know, there's a lot, it's a high demand job. There's a lot of physical demands with it. Um, a lot of the over the road uh, accounts that we have, it's difficult to find people um, because there's only a, a set profile that is okay with doing that. You know, a lot of people want that work life balance. So, um, so it continues to be a struggle, but it has, it's changed in the type of struggle um, that it's been since I've been with the company. The new government regulations are also making it increasingly difficult to, to find good drivers that have clean records because the new regulations are, are starting to affect both drivers and companies where it used to just affect the company if they got a ticket and things like that. So, yes, it's, it's, it's difficult. And we have pretty strict requirements. You have to have at least two years of experience, of driving experience, before we hire. And that can be difficult because you have somebody who's just gotten out of your YO tech and they're ready to go, um, and you know we, we can't hire them right away. So there's, you know, companies are getting more creative. They're having schools that they sponsor, um, and they kind of have just like uh, interns almost that you're driving while you're going to school, so that gets you that two years experience. So you just have to be creative, I think, with it. Okay, let's get into the interview. Now, this is the more participation part of the program. I let you off the hook because you don't really know Penske, so you couldn't really participate. But this piece, um, part of this, I need to hear your feedback to know where the concerns are and where the questions are around this. Um, so, oh, that did not show. But first thing I wanted to do is to let you know what you should not do in an interview. Now you're 
best accessory can be your smile. With Colgate Optic White Toothpaste, it whitens over two shades more than a leading whitening toothpaste. Now try new Colgate. Dad, um, I need to borrow some clothes for the interview since I don't have any fancy clothes. You go to my closet and take whatever you need. Okay. You too, Brandon. You guys, you guys got to look sharp. This is the most important day of our lives, okay? Okay, Dad. Well, Brandon, you certainly have a lot of jobs. I'm a bit of a smart plug and a uh, human resources lady. Oh, oh no, no it, it's actually, it's Pam. I'm oh, sorry. Well, Pam. No, my name is Pam. What are you saying? Pam or Pam? I'm saying Pam. Yeah, I'm sorry, who's this gentleman sitting behind you? Hello, Ms. Lady. I'm Dale. I'm Brennan's stepbrother, and I think I might be able to help with the Pam Pam dilemma. Yeah, that'd be great. Pam. 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 With There's an M. A There's no D. It's Pam. It's like calm. Here, it's P. A N M. And two M's. That was No, confusion. there's just one M. I, oh, okay, I think we've had enough. Shut up, one second. Shut, 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 shut. I need someone Wait, to shut up. Shut, shut up. Shut up. I'm sorry. What did you just say? I'm stupid. I'm coming off the stupid. You're wearing tuxedos to a job that requires you to clean bathrooms. Please leave this office. We're done with this interview. Do we get any sort of souvenir? Get out of my office! <laughs> Alright, usually I just do this for my own enjoyment. <laughs> Okay, so, how many of you get a little intimidated when you think about going on an interview? Tell me why. What's your biggest fear? What, do you, what, what, what intimidates you about it? Oh, I, I guess, uh, I don't know, I'm just like getting caught off guard for a question or something. Okay, you know, all you right. You don't expect something and it comes at you. Okay, so not being prepared for the question, what else? The fact that you know that every little thing that you do, you're being judged for. Okay. Very, very true. What else? Yeah. Having a mean boss in one of the interviews you. Okay, so having difficult personality. Absolutely. There are some of those out there. Not me, but some. So. Saying the right thing. Okay, being, saying the right thing and knowing if you said the right thing, right? What are they looking for? What kind of answers are they looking for? Anything else? <coughs> Well, here are some common ones, and we hit on some of them. What if I don't know the answer? I think that, that's pretty much the biggest one, that one. And what question? A lot of it with questions, right? Going into an interview, you really don't know what's going to be thrown at you, right? How do you prepare for it? What if you say the wrong thing? What if you don't know the answer? That was my biggest thing. What if they ask me something, and I have no idea what they even mean when they're asking me this question, right? And then there's all of the other things around, they're going to be judging me, right? They're going to be looking at everything, including what I wear, what I brought with me, what my nervous tics are, right? There's a lot of them. What I want to focus on a lot um, is the, the questions piece, because maybe I can give you a little bit of, um, almost kind of like a, a hint into what most interviews look like. Um, what some typical questions are, and they can be asked in a number of different ways. Um, but then also, what the, from an interviewer standpoint, and this is where Kyle and I can kind of add in, what we are looking for. Are we judging what you're wearing? Are we looking at your shoes? Are we looking at your resume, your cover letter? Okay? So we're going to cover all those, but then I'll ask you at the end if there's anything that we didn't hit on. Okay? All right. Here are the basics. First things first. Do some spring cleaning. Okay? This is very, very important. This is before you even have an interview scheduled. Because you've got to send your resume somewhere, right? On your resume, you typically have your phone number, how to contact you, you have your email address. Please, take the time and do some spring cleaning on that before you even send that out, okay? What does your email address say about you? Is it Big Time Boozer? at gmail.com or is it something a little bit more professional sounding, okay? Because that can say something about you. Even if it's like, I love my doggy dot gmail dot com. Make sure this all, it all ties into the image that you want to come across. So that does say something about you. You may want to tweak it or set up a different account for work, professional, and then for personal. Voicemail greetings. A lot, of, a lot of times people forget about this. 
this. Somebody's going to call you back, right, and they don't get you. They're getting your voicemail message. Now think for a moment. What does your voicemail message say? Is it, hey, what's up? I'm not here right now. Probably at the bar. <laughs> you know, I, listen, I say that because I've heard those things. I've heard the music in the background. I've heard the ringtones, like sometimes when you call somebody and music instead of hearing the, yeah, yeah it's a, Again, all of those things say something about you. All you've got to go on right now is your resume, your email address, your phone message. At this point in time, picture that you are competing with 50 other people, okay? So these things are very, very important. You want to just get to the step where you get called for an interview, okay? So all of these things really matter. Social media accounts. You, I'm starting to hear and, and read a lot more about organizations that are doing deeper dives um, into social media accounts. Now, there's some legalities around it, so people aren't hitting it too hard. But there's nothing stopping someone right now from Googling Karen Troxel, and then my Facebook profile comes up. Now, they're not going to be able to get in to see all my friends or the, the things that I've liked or anything like that. But at a minimum, they're going to see my picture. So even something like that, you've got to at least think about. Check your privacy settings on your social media. I always say that. If you really don't want anybody to have full visibility to your whole site, set it up. Especially if you're in your job search phase, set up maybe stricter privacy settings so people can't just post pictures of you. There's a way that you actually have to approve that. Okay. Dress code for an interview, probably one of the biggest questions I have, right? It's a no-brainer. Always dress professionally in the Always. Guys, it's the tie. Girls, it's either nice slacks and a um, professional-looking blouse, or if you have a business suit, that's not a bad thing. Now, some of the questions I'll get is, well, it's a more informal kind of organization, right? Um, so do I really, I don't ever see anybody in there that has a suit and tie on, or I don't see anybody in a business suit. They're all, work, they're all wearing jeans, or they're all very business casual. In those kind of situations, what do you think? What do you wear to those interviews? Do you match their dress code, or do you go professional? What do you think? My advice would be professional. Kyle? Yeah, actually, Same thing for you. yeah. If I could just take just a real quick second to touch on this, this is one of the most important pieces, and it's something that it's it, it's the first impression that you have with somebody that you're going to be interviewing with when they come out to meet you. How you dress and how you came prepared, the level of importance that you gave this interview is extremely important. So, for as you can see that Karen and I, I'm not in a tie, I'm not in a suit presenting to you today. This is the work attire that we have on a day-to-day -day, uh, throughout our organization. But if somebody comes to interview, I want to see them in a tie. Now, you guys are in college. I understand you're not going to have like an Armani suit or something. And if you do, you're doing better than I am. But you should be able to, you should be able to put a dress shirt, a button-up dress shirt on, find a tie, get one from a friend, whatever you have to do. Make sure that you come basically saying, look, I care enough that I want this job. And I want to portray that to you before we even say a word because I can tell you with 100% that when somebody, myself, or any, any of my counterparts walk out of an office and we come to greet you and say hello, the way that you dress is very important to, to how we're kind of our first impressions of you. So it's very important. I'm sorry. I just... that, no, that, and that goes for job fairs too. You know, we, we've gone to job fairs and the people that strike us are the people that dress for the job fair. Um, and it does. It doesn't necessarily mean that we would um, not consider anybody else at a job fair, but it does help us to kind of seek out those people that took the time to take it seriously. That's what that translates to us. That may not be the case, but that's what that says to us. And, and you, had, you had made mention earlier of some of your fears were not knowing the correct answers or different items that we're going to be touching on. This is one of those places where you can take the guesswork out. When, when, you, when you know that you took the time to dress accordingly and, and portray to the person that you're going to be interviewing with that you do care and that you are interested in that organization, that's one piece of the interview that you don't have to worry about anymore. You can focus solely on being yourself, being confident, and, and being prepared 
for the questions because if you don't go in and you don't feel like you're a million dollars when you yeah. go to interview, you're going to come across that way. So that's just one aspect of the interview that you can you cannot have to worry about at all. You know you've got that taken care of and you can yeah. just focus on the questions. Make sure to, um, and I put a couple on here that I was thinking of about dress code distractions, right? Don't have anything that's going to distract too much. Go more subtle. Um, perfume and cologne, you want to go more subtle because if it's overpowering and you're bathing in Axe or something like that, that may be the conversation that takes place after you leave the interview. You don't want that to be the conversation that takes place after your interview. Ladies with jewelry, okay, and I have a lot of the, the very, like, costume jewelry, the clingy, clangy charms and all that kind of stuff. I'm very aware of when I wear those things. If I'm presenting today and I was, and I had that on, that may detract <laughs> from the message that I'm trying, trying to give all you. So be aware of that. You don't want that to be singing a song while you're in an interview. Nail polish, don't go Britney Spears. Don't have half painted, chipped off nails. These are little tiny things. And some interviewers may not even know. Kai, would you take a notice if somebody didn't have their nails painted? It's not about being painted, but if it's something that's really distracting, it, to some people, that's not what you want. So take the time and think of, Kyle hit it right on the head, this is the one area you have 100% control over. Okay? Do you have any questions on this? What about um, wedding rings? Do you think, it, does that mean you with an impression one way or the other if they're wearing a wedding ring or not? I can take that. Most people would say no, and that is true. And even if it did, legally, um, a, someone who's interviewing can't, number one, they can't bring it up for discussion. Oh, I see you're married. Oh, tell me about your spouse. Where does your spouse work? Um, the, you're going into legal territories there. So legally, it's not a factor. So whether or not you have one on. Right. From, an interviewer's, yeah, from an interviewer's standpoint, I, I've never... Um, I've never known of anybody to to have any type of conversation about that or, or be anything that's a, a topic of discussion. Yeah. Other questions? That's interesting. Uh, do I need to dress to match the interviewer preference if I know the interviewer preference? Like, probably she like nail polish. <laughs> and I'm not, I don't know what I And <laughs> so could I just do the nail polish? Um, I would, let's say whether you know the interviewer or whether you don't, or and that's what we, what we were saying with the environment. If it's a more informal environment and you see jeans around, I would still, you're, it's never going to hurt to dress professionally, right? That's always something you want to do, okay? Now obviously, I guess in retail, if you're interviewing at a place, you may want to throw on some, some garb that they have, I would imagine, or but always just perfect. That's easy. Did that okay. answer your question? Okay, so other basics here. Make sure your resume is updated. A lot of it, how many of you have business cards now instead of the resume? I've seen those a lot of job fairs. Anybody have business cards made that you hand out? Okay, I've started to see that trend at job fairs that students come with a business card instead of a resume. Bring a couple extra copies. Even though you sent it, and even though obviously the interviewer has it because they called you for the interview, always bring a couple copies because they may have some other people sitting in on the interview. Um, so that way you have it there, you're prepared, okay? Before we move on from the resume, does everybody here have a resume at this point? Okay, when was the last time that you went in and updated it? A year ago? What's that? This morning. This morning? Good. All right, here's the one thing that I will say about a resume. A resume tells an interview, an interviewer a lot about a person. And it's not as much the content as if things are all over the place and if it's like four pages long and all these different things. You have, you have um, classes here and people that can help with resumes, correct? Mm -hmm. Strongly urge you to utilize that resource, okay? They'll help you, they'll help you figure out the best way to word things, they'll help you make sure that it's all neat and tidy on one page. It's not overwhelming, it's not underwhelming, but it gets the point across the information that you need. In a lot of instances, that one piece of paper, like Karen touched on earlier, is going to be what's going to separate you between a stack of 50 people as to whether or not you're going to get an interview. So, 
please. I know it seems like it's one of those things where it's like, uh, I'll just I'll hand this to them and then I'll knock their socks off in the interview. If you don't have your resume and it's not clean and precise, you may never get that opportunity for that interview. Good. Uh, the next piece, make sure you know whom you are, with whom you are meeting, names and titles. You may not know that off the bat, you may just have talked to the recruiter, but when you're at the interview, make sure you solicit that information. Ask for business cards, that's okay. Because I'm gonna recommend here in a little while that you follow up after the interview. You send a thank you email. So for everyone that you met, you're gonna to want to address them, all right, and make sure that you know their title. Even, and I'll talk about this in the follow-up, administrative assistants too, if they took part in helping you, send them a thank you. Sometimes they hold a lot of power and influence the leaders a lot in who's gonna be a best fit for this, okay? Um, the question that inevitably you're going to get at the end of your interview is, now then, what questions do you have for me? Take the time before the interview and prepare some. We just had a real world situation of this. Um, Kyle and I went to lunch um, a couple weeks ago with um, another coworker who was interviewing for another job within Pepsi. And we were kind of giving him a pat talk and this and that, and he was saying, so here's what I was going to prepare for, and what questions do you think they're going to ask me? And we very quickly turned it to, listen, you're going to be able to answer questions. We're not worried about that. What questions are you going to have for them? How you prepare the questions and how good your questions are, are good, because this is the last part of the interview. So this is the part that you're leaving with in some cases. So give some thought to it. All right, and there are some standard ones that you can put in there. What, you know, what, where do you see? What are the main goals that the organization has over the next five years? How have you seen this organization changed over the last five years? What are some of the goals that you have for this role? Was there anything that this role that you're interviewing for wasn't able to accomplish yet? Those are some. Just give some thought to them and have three to five solid ones down because some of them might have been covered. Have three to five down. Always, always ask a question. I've gone to some interviews where there were no questions at me. The interviewer said, well, I'm sure I've looked at all of your information and it seems like everything's in check, so I want to spend the time on you asking me some questions. Now, luckily, I had prepared some. If I hadn't, I'd have tanked that interview. Right? So spend the time to come up with good questions. All right. No matter what interview you go to, or the interviewer that's, that you are meeting with, there are some staple questions that we always go to. And we can word them in a different way, but these are some of the common ones. So here's your big hint. Write these down or, or make sure that you have these because if you want to prepare it all and have some control over the answers, this is what you practice. Practice, practice, practice until you can say it in your sleep, okay? First one is, so what do you know about our organization? It blows my mind how many times we've gone through and someone sends it, I've always wanted to work for Penske, I really think I'd be a good fit for your organization. And we ask the question, so what do you know about Penske? Uh, I, I think you guys don't raise me. Yeah, that's, that's right. You know, uh, the yellow trucks on the wall. Yeah, that too. And that's it. Or worse, well, I don't know. I'm not really sure what you guys do, right? Obviously, you're not serious about working for us if you haven't done that. Now, I'm not asking you to memorize their financial figures for the last five years or what their last shareholders meeting was like. So again, do small doses. Go on their website. Just go on their website first. What strikes you? Jot that down. Secondly, try to bank like maybe three or four things that you would be able to play back, okay? And if you can make it relevant, that's even better. If you're going for a supply chain position, right? Look at um, what types of customers they do, um, what modes of transportation they have, um, what type of product line they support. If you're going for a finance position, look to see if you can um, pull from their website any kind of financial information or what their growth has been like over the last five years. 
and quote that. If you're going for HR, what, how many associates do they have? What ha how has their team grown? How many locations? Okay? Those are things that if you're going for that position and you're able to play that back, that tells me not only have you done your research, but how I would answer that question is, well, since I'm interested in the HR field, obviously what struck me about your website was the career page. I thought it was done really solidly. I read some of the testimonials. It seems like you have a good training and development program. Right off the bat, that interviewer should take me seriously because they know I am truly interested in this job and have done my homework. Okay? What are your strengths and weaknesses? Or the fancy word for weakness, the opportunities. Inevitably, in some way, shape, or form, that's going to be asked. Here's what I want to tell you. The strengths is easy. We can all talk about our strengths forever. But don't say with the challenges or the weaknesses or your opportunities, I don't, really know. I don't think I really have any. Don't say that. Okay? Because we all have them. What I would recommend is find a way to articulate them in a positive way. Okay? So what I might say is, um, well, a, a challenge that I've faced in the past is that um, I tend to have a full plate all the time. And the reason why I have a full plate all the time is because I love to get involved in everything. I love to learn. I love to work with people. But unfortunately, it's difficult for me to say no to a project opportunity. So I say yes to a lot of things, and then I end up and I'm completely overwhelmed. So I stated my challenge, but also, I threw in how that is actually can work in a, to a positive, too. Does that make sense, everybody? So spend some time thinking of your weakness. Don't just say, oh, I struggle with managing time. Spin it into how that works as a weakness, but I struggle to manage my time because I tend to, if I'm in a conversation with somebody, I don't want to cut them short. So a lot of the times we're talking and I really want to listen to them so I may be late to the next meeting. See how that was kind of a spin on that. Anything else to say on that? You have no weaknesses, so. <laughs> yeah, come prepared. Come prepared to, to answer that question because, yes, it seems like a generic question, but it will be asked on every single interview. We just want to make sure that you've been able to do enough self-reflection that you can admit, okay, look, there are things that I'm not as good at as others, and I know that I need to work on it. So just make sure you are prepared. The next one, why are you interested in this role? Probably going to be asked, what made you apply for this? What was it that struck you about this position? Okay. Try to avoid the fluffy answers, and I hear this a lot. I love people. I love working with people. That sounds really nice, and you and 500 other people just said that during an interview. So if that is true, why? Okay. Articulate it professionally. So instead of, I just love people. Um, if you're going for a sales role, you know, I really enjoy working with people. I like the challenge of a sale, and I like meeting with people to understand what their needs are and being able to deliver them. It sounds a lot better than I just love working with people. Okay? So avoid those fluffy answers. Okay, the most intimidating question, at least it was for me, is tell me a little bit about yourself. Now, you would think that would be the easiest one. Like, oh, I'm good on this. I know me, right? But to try to condense that into a solid and articulate, nice little nugget is very difficult, especially for somebody like me because I could start soon I'm talking about my kitty Mason and, like, my childhood friend. Like, don't go there, <laughs> right? Try to keep all those answers to nice, condensed little um, short responses, shorter responses, and if they want to know more information, they'll ask. Here's what I recommend. How many of you ever, have ever heard the phrase of elevator speeches? Oh, great. Okay, perfect. Um, I would recommend you create an elevator speech about yourself around this question. 30 seconds. For those of you who don't know what elevator speeches are, um, if you picture that you get into an elevator, we, we talk about this, I'll, I'll talk about it in business terms, you get into the elevator with the CEO of the company and the CEO says, so what have you been working on? You have about 30 seconds to the time you reach your floor to be able to come across very professionally, eloquent, um, you know, and solid and leave a good impression. 
Um, and that's very hard for some people to do. So practice a 30 second elevator speech around yourself. You don't want to give your life story. Stay away from personal information. Number one, interviewers don't want to know about it. We're going to shield from that because we don't want to know anything personal about you just for legal reasons, okay? So don't talk about anything like that. Practice it until you could say it in your sleep. I've done an event um, at Penske. It was a networking, speed networking event, and all we focused on was creating a 30-second elevator speech about what you do. So if you were in the elevator with the CEO and he says, so what do you do for this company? A lot of people wouldn't be able to really articulate that. Well, I work on numbers, and there's a report on Tuesday, and I you go to lunch at noon, right? <laughs> it just, that's the impression you're leaving. So make sure you're able to stay in your sleep. Here's an example of one. I spent the last four years at Penn State studying to be an HR professional, and now I'm excited for the next phase where I can apply that learning while continuing to learn more on the job. Short sleep. Say it in your sleep. Okay? Because if you come at with that and give it like a punch, again, that shows that you're, you're, you're coming right out with that. that. That's a difficult, difficult question. Yes, and some interviewers will ask it because they want to see how you can respond to it. So that would be my recommendation for that. This question, tell me a little bit about yourself, is how I start every single interview. This question literally sets the tone for the interview because I want to know what, 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 are you, what are you interested in sharing with me? What can you tell me that I can find out just by asking this question as opposed to having to pry? So as she has here, you've got your third minute elevator speech. I may ask a follow-up question. Oh, okay, so you, know, you, you went to Penn State for four years. What did you do before that? So then we may, we may kind of get into the idea of um, you know, some, of the, some of the places that you've moved around or this and that. It can take a whole, it can take a variety of different roads. But having this and being able to come back with something as opposed to, like she talked about, well, you know, I, I uh, just graduated and I like cats and that's <laughs> about it. If you, if you start the interview with that, you can tell how you set the tone for failure, basically. So having something prepared to be able to, you know, tell them a little bit. You, I mean, remember, you're selling yourself to the interviewer. So if you're not prepared with an opening line of how you would sell yourself to the interviewer, they're probably not going to be buying, right? So this is an extremely important question for any interview. Um, I'm going to clue you in. This is trending a lot, it's been. But don't be surprised in an interview if a lot of the questions that you're asked are behavioral-based interviewing questions. When I'm training the managers that work for Penske on how to interview, I'm training them to create and ask behavioral-based interview questions. Here's what they are. Um, they force the applicant to pull from their experiences of what they've done. Okay? So tell me about a time when you failed to miss a deadline. Tell me about a time when you dealt with a difficult customer. Tell me about how you organize your day. Tell me about a time when you had to manage a team. Tell me how, about a time when you had to work with a team and there was conflict. How did you deal with that conflict? Okay? These can be difficult because guess what? You can't necessarily prepare for these. Like those standard, common, staple questions that I just went over, you can practice and practice and practice them. The behavioral-based interview questions a lot of the times, if you are just throwing out a, a generic kind of statement, well, I'm really good about managing my time. It's a strength of mine. That doesn't tell the interviewer anything. And what I would train my managers on is to probe. Well, tell me how you organize your day. Walk me through that. Tell me about the time when you managed it, when you dealt with a difficult customer. Oh, I dealt with difficult customers all the time in my job. They're really hard, but you know, I just make it through. That didn't tell me anything. Give me a specific example. That's what you're going to be after, and that's what throws people off. That's what I've noticed. In an interview, behavioral-based interviewing questions can sometimes throw you off your game, so don't let it. Be prepared to do that, and here's how I would recommend that you prepare for that. Take a look at your resume, okay, and take a look at the things that you've done. Now, I know you guys are in college right now, so you don't have 15 employers written down, but you've had summer jobs, probably, you've done babysitting, you've done 
no shoveling, I don't know what you do. I worked for Dairy Queen when I was in college. Um, spend about five minutes or so just looking at your resume and looking at the experience that they're going to ask you those behavior-based interviewing questions on. Refresh your memory, right? So think about what were the things that I did there? How did I spend my day? What was my team like? What was my boss like? What were the customers like? And just bring it all to the front of your head, okay? So that when you get to that, the behavioral-based interviewing questions, you can reflect on and provide the answer on something that you may have done five years ago because you just went back in time and collected that. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and make sure to include the result. That's something that I prompt my managers. Um, well, I dealt with a difficult customer the other day. They wanted a return, and I don't want to return it, and she threw a fit. Well, how did you handle it? What was the end result? Well, I had to call my manager, and she came over, and we handled the situation, and I told the woman that I, was, I apologized, and blah, blah, blah. So make sure you know um, what the result was and be able to communicate. All right, nonverbal. This is key too. These are things that are difficult, especially because this is habit stuff. Okay, so be aware of it. Get feedback from your friends and your families. Um, what type of maybe distracting, nonverbal behavior you have? If you're one that is constantly messing with your fingers or you know, doing your hair or something like that, or you use a lot of ums, well, I guess it would be more nonverbal. Um, you know, in and out of your pockets, shifty or whatever, too much with your hands. Try to get that feedback from people who see you every day, communicate with you, and just be aware of it, okay? Because you don't want it to be distracting. Don't let it distract from all the good meat and potatoes that you're delivering in your responses. Okay? Pace yourself and control your breathing. The people who I know are, who are really nervous during an interview, they're talking really fast and they start to lose their breath a little bit. Have you ever been there? I've been there before. So pace yourself. Almost to the point where you feel like you're going really slow. You're not. I promise you. I'm a very, very fast talker. When I get really excited about something, I really talk fast, so I've probably been rushing. But right now, it feels like I am turtle speed with communication. It may not come across to you like that, though. So pace yourself. It's going to give you the opportunity to think more about what you're saying so you don't lose your place. It's okay to pause, too, that third one in there. If somebody asks you a question, Tell me about a time. This usually comes with those behavioral-based interviewing questions. Tell me about a time when you had to manage uh, a team. Well, while I was with the county government, there was a project that we started and blah, 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 blah. It's okay to do that pause there because that's, again, I have all that stuff up here. That is my going back into my little collection of experience, pulling out and delivering. That pause is okay. Don't just shoot my well, if I can, I'm not really sure if I would ever manage a team, and that's when you start to lose your place a little bit, okay? Smile is so elementary, I was scared to put it in here, but I gotta tell you. If I'm interviewing somebody, and they're sitting there, and very formal and they're very strict and stern and they're giving them message and they don't crack a smile the whole time, I'm probably not going to offer them a job and here's why. What you say about what you've done, that functional stuff, I can really do this job, I am an expert in this field, I have the abilities, I have the experience, I have the, the schooling for it, I can do this job, you probably can. So now here's the next thing that I'm, I'm looking for in an interview. Are you going to be a good fit for this organization? Are you going to be a good fit for this team? I want to work with you. So the guy or the gal that's sitting there not cracking a smile and very formal and doesn't look like they have much of a sense of humor and they're thinking so much of what they practiced in the mirror last night, that doesn't leave me feeling that that person's going to be a good fit for the team. 
as much as you can, and I know you're nervous, relax and smile when you meet the person. Show your personality a little bit. Because you can be the best financial analyst in the world. Okay? <coughs> and you could do wonders for the organization. But if you don't show the personality that makes a person feel like you're going to be a good fit, you're probably not going to get that job. So yes, it's so basic and so simple. But boy, does that matter. Because if you're likable, even if you're not the best expert at this function, I want, to, I want this person on my team. I'm going to find a home for them. And we have those conversations all the time, don't we? Yes. Um, eye contact, critical, nothing too um, complicated with that. What to do with your hands? I'm a hand talker if you haven't figured it out. I do talk a lot with my hands. Um, so just make sure, if that's okay, gesturing is okay, just don't let it be too distracting. If you do have nervous habits where you're going like this or brushing your hair back, be cognizant of keeping it here. Okay. All right, last thing. Oh, yay. Okay, so here I, I created my little, little quiz here. Let's see. Um, I'm going to put up something and I want you to tell me if it's a do or a oh no, you didn't. Okay. So first one here, asking the question in the interview, what is the salary range for the position? What do you think? Is that something you can ask? <clears throat> yeah, that's fine, totally fine. <clears throat> totally fine to ask. Now it's not, I've had people that if I call, hi, Kyle, I saw that you applied for the, the, uh, the company for this position. I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. Well, before you do that, I just want to know what salary are you offering? Okay. So again, it's fine to ask in an interview, but just make sure it's not the very first thing that you ask for before their name, okay? Taking notes during the interview, you guys taking notes during the interview, what do you think? Yeah, that's okay to do. Don't spend the whole time doing it, right? But I would, that shows me that you're taking it seriously. As I'm talking about our growth opportunities and the customers and what this person's gonna do, that shows me because here's the thing that we all know but we don't really talk about, is as much as I'm interviewing you, you're interviewing me. Because I've got to think that you have about three or four other employers that want you, right? So I've got to put my best foot forward too for the organization, number one, to leave a good impression, but number two, so that you want to work for me, okay? So take your notes, right? So that you can make a good decision about where you want to work. Uh, when can I expect to be promoted? What do you think? Sorry. Asking it like this probably would come across a certain way. What you could say is what kind of career growth opportunities are there. I'm looking to grow. Um, what type of training and development do you offer that could help me get to the next role? That's okay to do that. I'm looking for a group that I can hang out a happy hour with. Is that cool here? <laughs> All right, so I threw in some of those. Too. Sorry. It, was, it was late. It was like 1230 when I was doing this last night. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh. <laughs> My friend is also looking for a job. Do you think she could interview here too? No. This is a tricky one. I would stay away from it. This is about you, okay? And what that might say is, okay, so now we're trying to get our friends to work here. This is about you and your own professional career growth. So I would stay away from that. And some of these I've been asked before I threw them in here. And yes, I was asked about the happy cover. Chewing gum during an interview. No. Don't. Don't have, if you, if listen, throw in your Tic Tac, but make sure it is digested by the time you get in. It's always good for good breath. That's great, but don't be chewing gum. Oh my goodness. Big, big, big distraction. Calling the next day to see if they've made a decision yet. Probably not. Um, calling the next week to ask about the status of the position. Sure, that's okay. And I'm going to talk in a second about following up. Um, when to do that. Having your phone out on the desk during the interview. No. Having it on vibrate during the interview. No. no. Make sure you don't, okay? Are you going to call my old boss because he didn't like me too much? <laughs> Got my question. <laughs> and actually, I'd like to have your job someday. No. I, I was asked that a couple of times too. That's very, it, it can come across very arrogant. You may want the job, but again, how you word it, um, 
says, could say something about it. All right, last thing here before we let you go. Um, following up, sending email communication, thanking them for spending the time. Uh, and I've crafted something quick. Thanks for spending the time with me after hearing more about the position. I'm excited for the opportunity and confident I can make a great positive contribution to your company. That's it. That's it. Short and sweet. Okay? Don't go too lengthy. That's what the interview was for. Short and sweet. Okay? Um, and send it to all that you met. Again, my little tidbit here. If an administrative assistant got you coffee or helped you find the location or talked to you on the phone about how to get there, send her or him a thank you too. Because sometimes they hold a lot of power. Okay? Um, establish a follow-up time frame at the conclusion of the interview and stick to it. It's okay to ask, when do you think you're going to be making a decision on the position? I would ask that. Well, we have some candidates that we're going through right now. We're going to be conducting interviews throughout the next week or so. So probably by the end of the month, okay? Bank that, write it down, and then it's okay. Don't call it next week. You're not going to have a decision. She told you that, okay? But maybe in a couple of weeks, call to find out about the status of the position. If you don't get the job, ask for feedback. That's okay to do. Some interviewers are uncomfortable giving that feedback, but it says something if you ask for it. It says that you want to improve about it, and that will say something to the interviewer. The interviewer may not spend 15 minutes with you talking about um, maybe all the tips and the do's and the don'ts, but it does say something that's respectful to do that. And don't overthink the interview. I've seen people crushed after they don't get a job. Keep practicing. Keep practicing your elevator speech and your responses so that you get good at it. Practice makes perfect. So as many interviews as you can go on to continue to do that, look at it as an opportunity that you're just getting more comfortable with an uncomfortable process. Okay? That's all I got. Questions? I didn't need a mic. Not only am I a fast speaker, but I'm loud. On that nonverbal slide you had up? Yeah. So, uh, it was critical of phone interviews, too. Thank you. Thank you. Phone interviews. <laughs> phone interviews are done a lot. I'm glad you said that because that is important. A lot of companies, you're not going to get in the door until after like a phone screen, even within a recruiter. So, still smile. Here's what I would do, because again, how you really prepare for a phone screen, it can make or break. How you come across on the phone, um, the interviewer is starting to picture what type of person you are. Here's what I do. I do this for conference calls, and I swear you can attest to it. If I'm in an office, this is embarrassing. If I'm in an office, right, and there's a window or something like that that I can see my reflection, if I'm on the phone, on the phone screen, I'm looking, I'm pretending I'm an aud my own audience. Because it helps me to be on stage. When you're on a phone screen, pretend like you're sitting across from an interviewer. It's going to help you be more polished, keep your thoughts together, pacing yourself. All of those things are easier if you're in front of somebody. So if it's you, your own reflection, do that. That includes the pauses, that includes the smiling. Smiling comes across on the phone. I mean, that's, that's a basic thing that we teach in communication class. So, thank you. Did that help you? Okay. Over here. What about the question, have you ever had a boss, a difficult boss? Yeah, I asked that. <laughs> and, um, what, you know, how did you work with that in the world? What's a good way to answer that? Right, and here's what I expect. Just as much as when I ask what are your strengths or your weaknesses, you're going to be able to come up with a weakness. There are difficult bosses. It doesn't mean that you can't work with them, though. So if I get something, if I get that question asked to me, think about a time when you may have had a conflict with the boss. We, one of my employers, our style's different. We're, we're a little different. And you could see that in some of the meetings that we had where he was on one side and I was on the other. But in every situation, we were able to come together and understand each other's point of view most of the time. So it, became, it was an effective relationship. See how I spun that, right? You could, also talk about how you've <laughs> you could also talk about how you've adapted to that boss's style over time. In the beginning, the way that they operated was 
was was different from the way that you work and and your with your the, you know, with your personality. But over time, you've learned uh, how to operate with them and kind of the styles they have. You're typically the type of person that tells a story and it takes five minutes to get to the point. Your boss is very. I want it right now. So you've learned to adapt. When you come in to speak with your boss, you would always make sure you had your bullet points. Be very precise, very quick, and you would hand them the information, and that is how you're able to bridge that gap and, and move forward. So how you've, how you've been able to adapt and, and bridge that gap is going to help you overcome that question with, with relative ease. Other questions? Yes, Mr. Um, and again, thank you, and thank you for coming. Yeah. We appreciate it, and they have business.